hopefully that's why. And okay. we can just adjust for those at the end. But I'm going to go ahead and launch it. All right, we should be live. All right. Hi, everyone. We are now with our live event ready to go. So my name is MJ Nelson. Just want to say hello and thank you to all for joining us today. I am the marketing manager for Cabo Care's uh, Total Care Infection Prevention Portfolio. And today with us, we are very fortunate to have our guest, Mary Govani, who has been doing work in the infection control and compliance compliance business for over 26 years now. So like she told me, this is not her first rodeo. She's going to be walking us through how we as the sales force should be re-entering the workplace and what practices we can be making sure to take advantage of so that we are not only consultative reps, but also keeping our practices as safe and healthy places for the workers. So with that, Mary, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on over to you. Okay, great. Well, welcome everyone. I'm glad that you decided to uh, join us today and I'm very thankful to um, Cabo Kerr for being willing to sponsor this event. So I know that you all realize what crazy times we're in and as crazy as it is for you or for me as a consultant, it's even crazier for our dental that we work with. So we need to make sure that we can provide them the best information we can. So the most um, valuable characteristic that I think that you all bring to the dental practices that you work with, that you serve, is that you are the trusted and credible resource for them. And that's something that we really need to ramp up. And I don't mean this in a bad way. I don't mean that you're not already there as that trusted, credible source, but it the, the game has changed. You know that. I know that. Dental practices know that. There is just utter chaos out there in terms of information and conflicting information. Can we go back to work? Can we not go back to work? If we do, what do we wear? How do we treat our patients? How do we screen our patients? So what we have to do is be the calming voices in the storm and give them the best, most credible information that we can. So in terms of ramping up your credibility, I would say the most important thing you can do right now is to make sure that you base all your product recommendations on evidence-based information, on science, not necessarily on marketing claims, because we're starting to see Almost the same thing that we saw for those of you who were working in dentistry back in the HIV AIDS epidemic in the um, late 80s, early 90s, we saw all kinds of crazy claims on products that were not backed up by science. And we're seeing some of those things with some products out there in the marketplace now. So we need to know what's the right resource, what's the right credentialing agency, if you will, for products, and make sure that you have this information available so that you can share it with your clients. And I'll show you, uh, I have a gift for you to be able to, um, to do that so that you can get that information to them. So again, ramping up your credibility would look like um, a partnership, and, and many of you already have this, but, but rely on those partners even more than ever. Um, consultants, lecturers, we all rely on the information from the incredible, wise, and wonderful Dr. John Molinari, and those of you that know him know that he is so user-friendly. He's always willing to answer questions and give us his science-based information. If you haven't already joined or your company hasn't given you access to OSAP, Organization for Safety, Asepsis and Prevention, then I would make it one of my goals to do that on a, on a personal level um, because OSAP's information, again, is all that credible CDC, OSHA, science-based information. Plus, many of you may know that OSAP and the Dental Assisting National Board have partnered to create an infection control certification. And there's two levels, one or two different designations, I should say. One is for an infection control coordinator in the dental practice, and the other is for industry members. And so you study 
a pretty heavy duty course on infection control and you pass that and complete some other educational requirements and then take an exam and you can have that designation. And I think, again, that adds to your credibility and the way you can help your, um, your clients. So make sure you're getting all the correct information. And some of you may already subscribe, but I just kind of want to review. Make sure that you subscribe to the CDC's MMWR, which is known as the Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report. It's a weekly newsletter. Um, you also can subscribe to daily COVID updates. Um, you can go to the um, CDC website. I'm going to try this and see if this will work, if the internet will, the internet gods will be fast for us. So this is just an example of the um, up updates, and maybe you already know about this, from the CDC website where you can get all of the latest information and you can also subscribe to that information. So make sure that you do that. Make sure that you have the latest information. Now, um, the other thing that um, the CDC has done is a toolkit. I'm not gonna take the time to show you that because I know you all wanna have a lot of time for questions and answers. Um, the ADA News you can subscribe to, your State Dental Association publications are great ones with information that's specific to your state, and every state has some little different twist on what's going on. And what I would do when you find these things, if you take a laptop or you take a tablet with you when you go to make a visit or when you're having a, a phone conference with your clients, then share copies with them. Don't assume that the practices necessarily know about this information because in many of the practices, the doctors may know and they may be doing their own research, but they don't always share it with the team. And a lot of times the person you may be interacting with in terms of ordering and, and helping them to make decisions is a dental assistant who may or may not even know that some of those resources exist. So a couple of things for you to know. Um, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention issued what they call interim guidelines for dental settings for dealing with the, the coronavirus situation. The last update before yesterday was April 7th, and there was a new update, as I said, just yesterday that has a little bit of new information in it about screening um, and um, checking for fevers and those types of things. So it's constantly being updated and that's why you need to make sure that you're keeping up with all of this information. Now, the other thing that I want to emphasize with you again is making sure that you are looking at information from product manufacturers. And I don't mean to speak ill of product manufacturers, but we all know that there are some that will try to leverage some information and make it sensational for people to want to buy it. And there are some products out there that are saying that they kill COVID-19. And it's a little bit too early yet for anyone to be making that kill claim, whether it's an air purifier or a surface disinfectant. And I'll talk a little bit more about surface disinfectants in a bit. But we need to be careful about selling products or, or representing products that don't have the appropriate designations. So on surface disinfectants, we look for EPA registration. Same thing for high level disinfectants that we used to call cold sterile solutions. Um, FDA clearance on equipment and devices. Now there's some changes in that, which I will mention to you in a bit, under the emergency use authorizations, but it doesn't completely um, alleviate us from the responsibility of utilizing FDA cleared devices. Then when we look at things like safety shields, some air purification systems and safety glasses and other items, there should be a NIOSH certification on those. FDA also puts a clearance designation on face masks, especially the N95 masks that are being promoted for, for use. Keep in mind that there is no such thing as OSHA approved or OSHA certified. 
OSHA does not approve things. OSHA sets up standards that manufacturers have to meet, whether it's an ANSI standard or it is um, a NIOSH standard or an ISO standard, something of that nature. But they do not approve individual types of personal protective equipment or other kinds of equipment. And this is one of the things that I want to share with you when I said that I have a gift for you. Um, if you will email me after we finish the webinar today, I will share with you this resource manual that I have put um, together that's got articles and um, ADA information and CDC information and information from the FDA, from OSHA, every resource that I can find. And I will ha be happy to share that with you. And that's something that you could then utilize to share with your um, doctors, with your clients as you're working with them if they need some information. And I'm also updating this both at the beginning and the end of every week because we keep getting new, um, new information. So again, make sure that you are looking at claims that are being made. And I'm re specifically repeating here again that there is no such thing as OSHA approved. Um, you can see in this ad, this is an air purification system, fight coronavirus with cutting edge technology. Well, what some of this information says is that it's certified, although it isn't clear who has actually certified some of this equipment. Um, and I tried to find it and couldn't. Um, it's saying that it's certified to kill the original SARS virus and the COVID, the virus that causes COVID is SARS-CoV-2. So it is a SARS virus, but it's too soon for testing. It's too soon to be making a claim that it kills something specific. And again, we're going to talk about disinfectants in a, in a bit. So be careful of the claims that are being made. If it says it has a certification, go do some research and find out what exactly is that certification. Is it NIOSH? Is it cleared through the FDA? We see lots of masks sterilizers out on the market now making all kinds of interesting claims. The problem here is and why I keep emphasizing this is that there's liability for doctors for practices that use something that doesn't meet the criteria like from the FDA. If it's not an FDA cleared medical device and something goes wrong and there's a disease transmission, then that practice is liable. And if they're not following the prevailing standards, what the requirements are, then even their liability insurance will likely not cover them. Um, a good example of this that we saw in the pre-COVID days was a recommendation for dental practices to use a dishwasher in their sterilization area for an instrument washer. And there was a specific recommendation being made for a Bosch dishwasher that had a sanitation cycle. And while it probably can do a pretty good job of cleaning instruments, the problem is that you can only use dishwashing liquid in it or you'll void the warranty on the dishwasher. The dishwashing liquid in most cases has, or the powder, whatever you use, has bleach in it, which can harm instruments. But the bigger issue is that that Bosch dishwasher or Whirlpool or General Electric, whoever made it, doesn't have an FDA 510K clearance as a medical device. And using that or a mask sterilizer or whatever the equipment is, in conjunction with patient care, especially during this time of the COVID virus being so highly infectious and so easily easy, easy to transmit could result in huge liability issues for practices. So I wouldn't want you to be making those kinds of recommendations to practices that could hurt your credibility, but also um, cause some liability for your practices. So what about disinfectants? We're hearing lots and lots of information right now about whether or not, and all your customers are probably asking you, does my disinfectant kill coronavirus? Well, pretty much anything can kill coronavirus. And so some manufacturers are making a big deal about having it as a label claim. Well, in order to have that as a label claim, 
they have to go back, the manufacturers have to go to the FDA and they have to get approved for a kill claim for emerging viruses. And it's again, so, so new, such a new virus, it probably won't necessarily say COVID-19 or um, SARS-CoV-2 virus, but it may say coronaviruses or other emerging um, pathogens or emerging viruses. But that's really not the issue. If you look at where coronaviruses lie on this chart here, they're at the bottom of the spectrum in terms of what is um, the easiest to kill. What we really are told to look for in the CDC guidelines for infection prevention in dental practices is a hospital grade intermediate level disinfectant with a TB kill claim. That's what we need to be doing. If we reduce ourselves to using a lower level disinfectant that only can say that it kills coronaviruses and some other viruses like HIV that are very easy to kill, then they're not meeting CDC guidelines. So that is a lot of hype that's going on right now. Everybody wants everything that kills COVID and any tuberculosidal disinfectant that you've been selling or manufacturing is going to kill the coronavirus. Okay, we need to follow. Now, we've seen some cavicide bashing lately. Um, I don't know how many of you follow um, Rella Christensen, and, and I know Rella, she's a lovely person. Um, but she has it in for most of the, the white products right now, and she will explain her rationale for that. But it's different than what the CDC says, what the EPA says, and what the Food and Drug Administration says about using products. So again, don't get all up in, you know, get your undies in a bundle, so to speak, about does it make a TB or a, a COVID kill claim, make sure it makes a TB kill claim, and then we know it's very broad spectrum. So here's an example from the Cava Wipes 1 kill claims. So you can see down the, down the list, human coronavirus not associated with SARS. So what's another human coronavirus? It's a common cold. That is also a coronavirus. So it doesn't say it's related to SARS, but look how far down the spectrum it is. This is where you need to be. Does it meet this kill claim? These are the most difficult bacteria to kill. If it makes that kill claim, it's been proven um, to be effective by the EPA and it's cleared to make that label claim from the FDA, then they're good to go. So I wouldn't sweat that. Don't worry about that, okay? Now, there's lots of regulations, lots of guidelines coming out. Um, and I just, again, wanna make you aware of these. And these are actually in that resource that I will send you. Um, if you go to the, the OSHA website, you'll see it, the coronavirus information is, of course, on the homepage. But one thing that I would do if I were you is sign up for the Quick Takes newsletter. This comes out once a month and it will tell you what's happening in um, all states, what's happening with OSHA. Um, so it's a great thing. You can get it on your, um, on your phone, you can get it on a tablet, you can get it on your computer. And all you have to do when you go to that website is hit the subscribe button and then make sure that you add it to your safe list in your um, email recipients so that you get it um, from them and it doesn't go to the spam folder. Then the next thing you wanna do is go to subscribe to the FDA updates newsletter. And again, it's just entering in your email address, hit submit, they'll send you a confirmation and then you'll get information. I usually get um, at least one, sometimes two of these every day. And those become important because again, we wanna make sure we're using EPA or FDA cleared devices. Now, here's something that you've probably heard about, but this is gonna become very important because it's being, I think, misrepresented in some areas. The FDA, 
understanding that things like face masks and other personal protective equipment and testing kits for COVID have been in very short supply, has used a piece of legislation called emergency youth use authorization. And what this does is essentially sort of loosens the, the guidelines, um, loosens the, the laws and allows for devices to be used temporarily that haven't been FDA cleared or don't have FDA clearance um, in order to help keep people safe. So the best example I can give you is N95 masks are in very short supply, although I'm hearing people are, are getting orders now that they've placed a long time ago. And so in, in light of that, the FDA it, um, issued an emergency use authorization for KN95 masks made in China or made according to a Chinese standard, not cleared through our FDA at this point, but we're able to use them. You're able to recommend and sell them because of this e EUA. Um, it doesn't mean that's forever. It just means that in a temporary shortage, you can do that. So if you want to get updates or you want to know, this is the link and this is in the information that I will send you, and it will take you directly to all of the, the authorizations. There's a whole list of FAQs that could be very, very helpful for you to know. So if you're in doubt whether something can be used or not, that will help you. Um, and again, you're leading your doctors, your clients, to a place of making sure that they are compliant. So here's more information for the um, emergency use authorization devices. If you scroll down this page, you'll see all the things that are being added to them. And we see some things like respirator decontamination devices, and we see um, non-NIOSH approved respirators manufactured in China. So we're getting a lot of good information and it's all there for you to access when you're in doubt about that um, information. The other thing that you may want to subscribe to is the Environmental Protection Agency newsletters. And the reason I will tell you this is remember that the amalgam separator rule takes effect in July. Um, for every dental practice, not just new new practices, but every dental practice in every state by July 14th of uh, this year will have to have their amalgam separator in place, installed, and by October of this year, all of the states, all of the users in, in every state will have to file a one-time use or a one-time um, filing that certifies that they have their um, amalgam separator in place. And the EPA will be the link to the various states that you may be working in that will tell you wh who has the form, because right now it's kind of a little bit of everything. Some states have created their own forms. Some states are waiting for the EPA to create a federal form. And so you need to keep up on that and know what um, kind of information is helpful for you. And then the last of the agencies that I want to make you familiar with is NIOSH, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. And there's a lot of information here, not just about COVID, um, but personal protective equipment, um, respirators and doing assessments and fit testing and so forth. And there's great information about decontamination and reuse of respirators or um, N95 respirators. So those should be some of the best resources I could possibly give you to stay current, to know, to research, and to be that trusted, um, credible resource that we know that you are. So let's take a look at what the new normal may be like, because your life will probably change considerably um, or already has changed given all of these um, things that are swirling around us. Um, first and foremost, you may know, if you don't know, I can share a copy of this with you. The American Dental Association on Monday um, published a return to work toolkit. It's, it's meant to be guidance. It's not law. It's not OSHA rules, but it is based on CDC and it is based on OSHA standards. Um, and there's some other things in here that um, need to be discussed, but this is a great document 
for helping practices know what to do. And, and so many of them are just lost. They're overwhelmed with information. But some of the practices, as I found out yesterday, thought that this meant that they're able to reopen their practices. Well, if the ADA says there's a return to work toolkit, that means we can go return to work. But they can't necessarily if their state hasn't listed or lifted an executive order for them to be able to go back to work. But still, it's a good, um, good guideline. Now, the thing to remember about practices going back to work is, and I've said here for the foreseeable future, we don't know and and I don't believe in talking with a, a lot of experts that all of the new guidelines are going to be forever. For example, we know that the CDC says in their interim guidance that we have to follow right now about respiratory protection is that N95 is the best, followed by a KN KN95 mask and sort of the last resort, if you can't get either of those, an ASTM level three mask and wearing a face shield. But what we don't know from OSHA yet is whether they're going to expect us to wear N95 masks forever or if it's just during this time of the pandemic. And so because the pandemic isn't over, we know the, the virus is still gonna be present, we may need to. There will need to be in every dental practice screening and that will most likely include you all um, that you will be asked if you're perhaps setting up an appointment to meet in person with your customers, with your clients, that you're asked about symptoms, about the potential for exposure. Is there anybody in your household that may have been exposed or has symptoms? And what about travel? And they're looking at travel within the last 30 days before a lot of the shutdowns took place. And then there may be follow-up screening for you all afterwards. The ADA and the CDC are certainly recommending follow-up um, questioning of patients after they've been treated or been to the office because if anyone has developed symptoms after they've been there, it's very possible that they may have already been symptomatic, or not symptomatic, but infectious and exposed people while they were in the office. So that may very well change for you that you're going to be questioned. So what a what does your business relationship look like then with um, with the doctors? I would say probably virtual sales calls that you're meeting by Zoom. And I think we probably do anything and everything by Zoom now. I'm having a virtual cocktail party with a client at the end of the day today. And we've been working really hard on updating their protocols. And so we're going to virtually celebrate that. Um, you may need to schedule specific times to go meet with practices instead of um, showing up if you don't already. Um, you will be asked, you should be asked, just like the patients will, to wash or sanitize your hands as soon as you come into the facility, that you'll see either a sanitizing station, if people can get hand sanitizer, or you'll be directed to the, the restroom to wash your hands. Somebody may be checking your temperature when you walk into the building. And at this point in time, my recommendation to you would be to wear a face mask. Now, I don't know that you need to wear an N95 mask. Um, you can if you want to, if you can um, have access, if you can tolerate one, but it needs to be fit tested. Um, but simply wearing a face mask when you go in because there will be aerosols and we know that aerosols can stay airborne for a period of time. And then wash or sanitize your hands as soon as you leave the practice but be ready for somebody to come at you with a, a, uh, an infrared thermometer, a non-contact thermometer, and they'll scan your forehead and they'll let you know if it's okay to uh, enter the office. So those are, again, sort of simple things that you will need to, to sort of adjust to. Um, but I wanna also spend some time talking about PPE for the teams because that's where undoubtedly you're getting most of the questions from um, your clients right now. Everybody's in the panic about the, the N95 masks. So what we're operating under right now 
uh, is the CDC interim guidance that I showed you before, and it's based on treating emergency patients. So that has not been changed yet to treating patients with um, for elective procedures. We're still under this interim guidance for the time being, and we have to be there. We also have the same type of guidance from OSHA. I will send you a copy of that guidance. And what they're saying are in descending order of protection is that it's N95 is the best, followed by KN95, followed by ASTM level three. And the biggest difference, honestly, is not necessarily the filtration um, ability of the face masks. It's about the fit. The KN95 fits reasonably well, not as tight a seal around the face as an N95. So if you put on an ASTM level three mask, you know, you notice that there are gaps on the sides. It doesn't seal at the top or the bottom as well as a respirator does. And so what that means is then that aerosols, which are present in the air, can get inside the mask every time that healthcare worker inhales, they can be bringing some of those aerosols inside the mask. So that's why it's so important. That's the, the relevance of that respirator is the seal. Now, if for some reason a dental practice could not get any PPE, they can't, or face masks, I should say, they can't get level threes, they can't get N95s, they can't get KN95s, they shouldn't be treating patients at all. They should refer a patient with an emergency to a provider that does have PPE or they need to go borrow some from somebody that has it, but they shouldn't be putting on a level one or a level two mask and seeing patients if they don't have any of those. Just shouldn't happen. So again, here's just a little more guidance. This comes from the ADA. This is part of their, um, one of their documents that they um, published on their website a, couple, a week or so ago. So N95 has a, wearing an N95 presents a low level of risk to the um, wearer in terms of exposure to COVID or tuberculosis or other respiratory viruses. Same thing with KN95, it's considered to be an equivalent. And then the surgical mask only provides protection so that there's still a moderate risk of um, exposure to COVID or other viruses. So that's why the recommendation is for face shields with those masks in the absence of N95s or KN95s. And so we can't just say, well, I don't want to pay the extra money for the N95s. It says I can use the, um, the level three surgical mask. I'll just do that. That is putting team members at risk. And I got to tell you, I am getting phone calls and email messages by the hundreds from assistants and hygienists who are very worried about going back to work. And many of the doctors who are perhaps not as convinced of the risks or they just don't value the importance of infection prevention are telling their workers, this is it. This is as good as it's gonna get. I'm not gonna buy these more expensive masks. And these workers are concerned. They're concerned for their health. They're concerned for the health of their families and their patients. And I, I hate to see it happen, but I think what's going to happen is if these workers are required to come back to work in order to get their, their paycheck and wear substandard um, respiratory protection that they may refuse and they may go and report their um, employers to OSHA or they may report their employers to the state dental boards. I'd hate to see that happen, but I have the feeling that it may. So we're hearing a lot about decontaminating N95 respirators. I would tell you don't encourage your doctors to do it. OSHA takes a dim view of this at this point because of what is currently available. It, it would have to be something that's FDA cleared. And the problem is that if you can find an FDA cleared device, it is probably going to cost a practice somewhere around eight to ten thousand dollars for that device and i'm not sure that that is a good investment for a doctor given that the supply of n95s is now starting to improve and that they have a kn95 alternative 
And we don't know if this is going to be the forever requirement. We don't know that yet. If we find out that it is going to be a requirement from OSHA that we always wear an N95 respirator, then different story. But I would not encourage people to buy these devices right now when we're still very unsure. Because if it doesn't become a requirement forever to wear N95s, then these doctors have spent a lot of money that many of them don't have right now on something that they won't need and it's going to sit in the corner and gather a bunch of dust. So be careful. Now I'm going to send you a link to this um, Facebook uh, video that I want you to go and watch. This is a really, really cool doctor who has um, created a hack. Some of you may have seen this. She's created a hack to fix the um, gaps on the sides of the level three ear loop masks and it's just way cool. Um, she and I've had a couple of conversations. Um, I'm very impressed with this. At first when I saw it on a Facebook feed I thought oh no here we go again because there have been some really bizarre things that doctors have come up with including boxes made with PVC pipe and plastic sheeting that you put over the patient's head and then stick your hands in the sides of these boxes to control the aerosols. And I thought maybe it was gonna be one of those, but it's really, really good. So I'd encourage you to go take a look at that. And then we have, of course, the, the guidance from CDC right now, and it looks like OSHA is really pushing us to using face shields. Um, they may be in short supply right now. Um, and you probably have lots of people placing orders for face shields, but the biggest concern is not necessarily the face shield, it's whether the chin length face shield is gonna work with loops and lights. And so I'd encourage you to do your research and find out what's available for you. Um, the two that I'm showing on the bottom of the slide here come from Dental Safety Solutions, and I found them on the Dental Health Products Inc. website and this one appears to have a little opening that you can have a light come through which would be great because many doctors of course have those shields that go over their lights that they can um, put them on when they're doing um, um, curing and so they're not going to um, cause extra or premature curing of, of some of their materials. So we really have to know what's out there, what's available, what will work for practices. Now, I've had a lot of questions about what about the face masks that have the shields attached to the tops of them. Those really don't provide the protection that we want. They help with eye protection, but what we want to do is prevent the contamination this spatter splatter from contaminating the outside of the face mask. So that's the rationale for the chin length face shields. Now, this is one that doctors will absolutely go crazy over. Um, I'm not sure that it's quite settled in with everybody yet. The reality that is that the interim CDC guidelines say that gowns must be changed after every patient. And that has not been the norm with OSHA compliance or OSHA regulations in the past, but because of the infectivity of this coronavirus. So if you wear a reusable gown, it must be taken off in the treatment room before you leave and sort of take it off, turn it inside out, wad it up into a ball, and then there has to be some kind of a receptacle for the laundry in the treatment room. Um, or if you wear a disposable, it again needs to be taken off in the treatment room and um, disposed of with the contaminated gloves and face masks and all those types of things. So again, if they're reusable, they have to be either laundered on site or you use a laundry service, but you cannot um, take it home or employees cannot take their laundry home. That's an OSHA rule that's been in effect since 1991 in the bloodborne pathogen standard. But this will cause some doctors to perhaps need, I'll be really irreverent here, a little underwear change when they find out that they have to have a gown for every single patient. And I'm sure we'll have some discussion in the Q&A about what do they do for hygiene patients. Now, what is recommended in the CDC interim guidelines and what OSHA is looking at um, requiring, but we don't know for sure right now, are hair covers and shoe coverings. It, it isn't a requirement. A lot of people are requesting them. I don't know if I would 
be as concerned about the shoe coverings because someone could bring a pair of shoes to the office and leave them there. Um, and we wouldn't want to have to change. If you put them on and they're disposable, you have to change them after every patient. But I think the hair coverings make sense because of the spatter splatter that may get in the aerosol that may settle in the hair. Um, and I think probably, although it's not a recommendation, but it's a good idea, and many healthcare workers will share that they do, is they go and get in the shower as soon as they get home because they don't want to be infectious to their family members. So the big concern right now, of course, is what about all the aerosol in dentistry? And we know from the science, from the research, that aerosols can stay present in the air in a treatment room, primarily in the treatment room itself, for three hours. And the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID has been isolated from those aerosols within that three hour period of time. So what does that mean? Um, it may mean that doctors, at least for the time being, will not be able to schedule the way they have in the past, that they can't have, for example, an orthodontic practice especially in an open base situation, may not be able to use every chair all the time. They may have to go to every other. They may have to put up some temporary barriers like a curtain or some kind of plastic sheeting in between the chairs to control the aerosols. Um, same thing with some pediatric practices. There um, will be changes even in, in non-open bay treatment settings that we need to be cognizant of what is going on with those aerosols. And so not just the HVE, but do we need extra oral suction or some other devices to control the aerosols? Now, again, I think we need to be a little bit cautious about what we recommend to our doctors right now because we don't know what the final requirements will be from OSHA. But there's some inexpensive kinds of things that can be used um, to control the aerosols. You've probably heard there's a recommendation. Um, the ADA recommended it and then they didn't and now they are again it, because of the CDC guidelines using pre-procedural mouth rinses. One is peroxide, the other one is povidone iodine. I wouldn't even go there with an iodine rinse because many people have allergies to iodine and you don't want to take a 1% diluted hydrogen peroxide right out, dilute it right out of the bottle and give it to patients to rinse with because it's gonna taste horrible, they're gonna hate you. But we do have some 1.5% um, solutions that are available, peroxyl from Colgate, Listerine whitening, I believe has 1.5% um, hydrogen peroxide. So those are some good things, but the problem with that is it only gives you a decrease of microorganisms for the first time the patient takes a breath. Then, because remember, these viral particles are coming from their lungs. And so in order for this to be the only way that we control the aerosols, they'd have to be rinsing with this all the time. Every time they took a breath, according to one of the, the ADA science officials uh, from the American Dental Association. So it can help. It's just not going to help that much. The other issue then is what kind of HVE devices do we have that can help, especially hygienists. We don't know whether hygienists are going to actually be allowed to use ultrasonic scalers when they go back into practice. We don't really have some have guidance on that yet. Um, so we're just going to have to stay tuned. But you know, the Mr. Thirsty from Zerk is one great um, device that can help. I like the um, Isovac from Zyrus. I think that helps. And then we always have the old fashioned using a dental dam or rubber dam um, it, to control aerosols. But rubber dam is not effective. Hygienists can't use it. It's not effective for all of the restorative procedures that doctors may be doing. Now, here's one thing that is being um, recommended a lot. And I will say that I personally, this is my personal opinion, I am in favor of these extra oral evacuation devices, although I know that there's some drawbacks. One is that they're large and it's another piece of equipment to roll into the treatment room. 
They are spendy. There's, there's an investment required for the doctors, but these devices have the science behind them about controlling the aerosols. So especially for hygienists, for the interim, they would be amazing devices. And beyond COVID, I think what this whole um, COVID pandemic has taught us in dentistry is that we should have been paying attention to the aerosol hazards for a very long time. And I think these are the type of devices that will help us to create a healthier environment when the flu season comes around, when we're doing ultrasonic scaling, even on a healthy patient, we know there's still microflora in the oral cavity that are being aerosolized. So that makes good sense to me. But again, there's the, the space that's required for it and the investment. Now, the other thing that we have to look at right now is there's a lot of air filtration systems that are being marketed that are being promoted and I know a lot of doctors well I bought this air filtration system for every single one of my operatories well it, they're not a bad thing don't get me wrong it and we just need to be careful about what kind of certification where's the science because according to the National Air Filtration Association and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health there is nothing that has been proven tested, proven, certified to kill COVID, but UV light can kill it. Um, we know that these filtration systems can help improve the, the room air, excuse me. <coughs> so it's not that there isn't a good use for them. We just have to be careful to make sure we have the science behind them. Now, can they hurt? Absolutely not. They can help create a healthier environment for everyone, patients, team members, um, everyone in, in the practice, but they're not the be all end all that we may think they are. So I'm thinking that OSHA, what OSHA is gonna say is we probably need a combo of something to control the aerosol better, not the devices that hygienists have used in the past that connect to the low volume or the saliva ejector. We're all going HVE now, high volume, um, but a combination of those devices and air filtration is probably what OSHA is going to look at. But OSHA has also been looking at requiring negative air pressure in dental offices, and that will be outrageously expensive to do. So just to sort of wrap up, because I know you all want to do some Q&A, um, up your game by doing research. Make sure you have the science behind you when you're making recommendations or when you're evaluating products to, to recommend to your clients. Be the, the target um, for getting that information to your patients. Make sure that you have the accurate information, the things that you need. And if you're not really sure, then reach out to someone, to a consultant that you know, to a speaker that you know, to someone that can help guide you to the right place. And then be prepared for what kind of changes may take place when you start to interact with your clients because it will be different but and i know it's just such an overused phrase right now but i gotta say it we're in it together we'll get through it it'll be okay many people thought we'd never survive adapting to all the ppe changes and all the osha requirements related to hiv and aids but we did and it became routine for most people. Now we just need to up the game a little bit and make a few more changes. So with that, I'm gonna turn this back over to MJ for Q&A. Hey, well, first off, Mary, thank you for everything. That was phenomenal. And thank you so much for taking the time to put these slides together to make us prepared for when we go back out into the field, because it is going to be a dangerous place. And we want to make sure that we are best prepared to keep everyone safe. So I've gone ahead and made an announcement in the live event Q&A. You should be able just to type in questions. It's open right now to receive any questions. We did have one already from Don, uh, Mary, and that was if the PowerPoint would be available to the people who watched this or if we could get just a list of the links that were used in the PowerPoint. Absolutely. What I will do is turn the PowerPoint into a PDF document. And if you will email me, my email is Mary, M-A-R-Y, at 
Mary, M-A-R-Y-G-O-V-O-N-I.com. And just put webinar in the subject line and tell me um, that you want a handout and I'll send that to you in the PDF handout. All the links will be active. And I will also send you a copy of that COVID resource manual that I put together, but it's a huge file. So that won't come directly from my email. It will come to you from a secure program called We Transfer, but it'll say it's coming from me. So you'll have that. So I'll send those out to you probably this evening because I have two more webinars to do yet this afternoon. So I'll get those out to you tonight. Awesome. And just to repeat that email, uh, I went ahead and typed it in the notes as well, the meeting chat, but it would be Mary at Mary Govani. And the last name is G O V O N I dot com. And the subject line is webinar, and she will get you that information. Thank you so much for taking care of that, Mary. You bet. You bet. And then. So we got that. That one's taken care of. Are there any other questions? Looks like we got a new one. Um, just a response from Don saying thank you. Awesome. Welcome, Don. <laughs> cool. Uh, any other questions out there? I want to just make sure that we give you all the time for anything that was brought up. If you'd like to ask, please do so now. And yeah, Mary, thanks again. That was fantastic. Well, thank you. I feel like I fire hosed everybody with a lot of information. Um, you can also, e if you have questions after the fact, you can also email them to me and that would be fine. Wow, you are an amazing resource. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, we do have a question. Uh, what is, so sorry, one more time. What is the guideline for biohazard bags for used PPE? Oh, great question. Um, that could vary from one state to another, but in general, um, you don't necessarily have to use a biohazard bag for disposing of what is called unregulated waste. So it something that doesn't isn't saturated with blood, something that's not a sharp. So the same type of situation where you would have a waste container in a, in a treatment room that you would put your contaminated gloves in, your face mask, um, any of the disposables from treatment just simply goes into a container that OSHA says has to be covered. And so it could be a container that has a lid on it that's kind of out in the open or OSHA considers a container that's inside of a cupboard with a maybe a drop through from the counter, that's considered to be a covered container as well. It's protected by the cabinet. And that's simply where you would put those disposable gowns. Now, those containers do have to have a biohazard label on the outside of the container to warn anyone that if they were gonna go dumpster diving in the trash that there's <laughs> items in there. Um, I can't think of a better way to describe it, but um, so you don't have to have any special handling of that waste. I know some people were concerned about how much waste they would be having, but again, keep in mind, we think this is temporary, but we don't know for sure yet. And you can then take those gowns and wad them up in, you know, to a ball after you've turned them inside out and put them down in the trash container, but they don't need special handling. Thank you, Mary. Okay, the next question is with a new gown for every patient, just to clarify, uh, when leaving the room and going back to the same patient, you need another new gown, correct? Well, and I think maybe this question is based on what may happen with doctors going to check hygiene patients. So what, what will probably need to happen, we don't have the absolute guidance on it and we don't wanna have to, to make our consumables expense just go crazy. So if I'm working on an operative patient and I need to go do a hygiene evaluation, then what I would do is have my assistant untie or unsnap my gown if it's one that unties or unsnaps from the back and have them remove it, help me pull it down my sleeves and save that gown 
in the treatment room that I can then have my assistant help me put back on with that same patient when I come back. Now, if you're going in to do hygiene evaluations, typically the doctors are not creating aerosols, okay? So if they're not creating aerosols, then they may not, and again, this could change, we could get new guidance, they may not have to have a gown on for doing a hygiene evaluation, but we don't know that for sure. So worst case scenario would be, yes, you would take it off when you leave the treatment room, go put another one on when you do a hygiene evaluation, take that one off and leave it in that treatment room. God forbid you have to go to another hygiene evaluation, another gown and take that off. But for the interim, that's exactly the way the guidance says, okay? Um, because we're still in this pandemic, because we know that even if you're not picking up a handpiece or an air water syringe, that just from a patient talking or breathing, they can be dispersing droplets that could be infectious. But I think you could make a case for going into that treatment room without a gown, do a hygiene evaluation. Then before you leave the treatment room, you wash your hands, take your gloves off, wash your hands, wash your arms up to the elbows, assuming that you have short sleeve scrubs underneath that gown, and then go to the next um, hygiene evaluation and do the same thing, but know that you may have some contamination, so you can't touch the front of your scrubs because there may be some contamination on those scrubs. So it, it's ugly right now, but in the true sense of what the CDC says, it's take that gown off. I think you could save the one that you were using in that treatment room, put a new gown on when you go into do a hygiene eval, throw that one away, put another one on when you go to do the next hygiene eval. And I understand you're gonna spend your entire day taking clothes off or putting clothes back on in the um, doing those evaluations, but you know what? Patients are going to be expecting to see that, that you are changing or the doctors are changing that PPE in between. So hopefully I didn't muddy the waters for you. No, thank you so much um, for taking that one and really being very detailed with it. Uh, the next question is, can the N95s be sterilized in an autoclave if a customer absolutely needs to reuse it? Well, right now, um, the FDA emergency use authorization does not allow them to be sterilized in an autoclave. Um, and the problem is that once you put it in an autoclave, that's why UV light and some dry heat at certain temperatures is part of those mask sterilizers and not an autoclave, because an autoclave with the steam makes the mask damp. Once the mask gets damp, then the filtration and the fluid resistance is gone. So it's the same thing. I know a lot of doctors before the close, the, the shutdown of practices, a lot of doctors were saying that they were going to um, sterilize either autoclave or put disinfectant on their um, ear loop masks. And you can't do that. First of all, the second you get it wet, it's no good anymore. In fact, the CDC guidance has told us for a long time that you wear one face mask per patient, but if it gets wet in the middle of treatment, you need to change it immediately. So no autoclaving of masks, none. Thank you so much. Okay, and then we had a question if this was being recorded and of how you could get it. This should be being recorded. It is a live event on Teams, so everything Mary has been saying and all these questions are recorded. Uh, I would just ask that you reach out to Kathy, Todd, or myself afterwards, and we will be able to email you over the link. That way you could share with customers or other dealer reps or sales reps just to make sure that we're all on the same page about keeping the workplace as safe as possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question for you, what if they can't get enough jackets or gowns right now? So with the PPE sword, it's what is the recommendation, Mary? Well, it's the same thing for the face masks. If you don't have the appropriate PPE, then you're not ready to be seeing patients again. 
Um, and I know that the doctors aren't going to like that, but they have the option. They probably can find reusable gowns or jackets that they can, um, they're going to have to do the laundry at the office. Um, they don't have to use disposables, but again, it's going to be a lot of gowns and a lot of laundry. But if they can't get masks and they can't get gowns to wear to protect themselves, then they're not ready to see patients. And that's why some people think they're just going to be able to go into the office and turn the lights on, turn the compressor on, turn the HVAC system on, and we're good to go. And that is not the case. If there isn't sufficient PPE, CDC and OSHA both say, no patients being treated unless it's an emergency only. Awesome. Well, thank you for that because yeah, it's going to be tough, but we need to have those tougher conversations with our dentists because they're going to be the ones really keeping yeah. people safe or putting people in danger. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions before we finish up and just kind of give Mary a round of applause for crushing it today with a great presentation? <laughs> Give it another 30 seconds, minute for anyone who wants to type in. And once again, uh, for those of you who are interested in the information, the PowerPoint slides and like just a copy of the webinar. So for the slides and the PowerPoint, you would email Mary at Mary Govani, and that's G-O-V-O-N-I dot com with the subject line being webinar. And then for the recording, reach out to Todd, Kathy, or myself. And my email is, I'll put it in the comments, going to be michael.nelson at kvocur.com. Cool, that was a great question. And then we have, we don't even have comments anymore. We just have people saying thank you, Mary. So great job once again. Well, and good luck to everybody. I know these are tough times and hopefully they will be better times ahead. Yeah, that is so true. Well, thank you all for joining and hopping on. Wish you the best rest of your Tuesday and we just hope that the rest of your week goes well and thank you again Mary for everything that you were able to put together and do for us. You bet. Thank you. All right. Bye all. Bye everybody.